Queen's Gambit is a Netflix series that, after just four weeks, had become Netflix's most watched scripted miniseries. Netflix has also released a little documentary about its beautiful set design and enthralling storyline, although sadly, nothing about the VFX. But not to worry, as we got together with the people responsible for the VFX on the Queen's Gambit, Chicken Bone Effects, and had the opportunity to speak with Chicken Bone's VFX producer. Hi, I'm Rose Blassengame. I'm the head of production at Chicken Bone Effects, and I was the VFX producer on the Queen's Gambit. And the VFX supervisor on the Queen's Gambit. Hi, I'm John Madra, and I was the visual effects supervisor for the Queen's Gambit. To find out just what went into creating these very tasteful VFX. Also, stay tuned until the end of the video where we'll be revealing an exclusive to fame focused Easter egg hidden within the VFX that, as far as we know at the time of making this video, nobody's found yet. Let's begin. Packed full of beauty and emotion, The Queen's Gambit does a wonderful job of drawing you into every scene and making you feel well connected to the protagonist and her feelings. The VFX are subtle and when they do appear in the foreground in the form of a chessboard on the ceiling, they somehow still manage to feel natural and full of emotion. How did you come up with and decide on the actual look and style of, of that whole thing? Right. Rose, you want to see this one? It was quite a process. The uh, chess pieces themselves were based off of the first pieces she ever plays with um, in the basement with Mr. Scheibel, where she kind of starts to build her confidence as a chess player. And then playing in the basement with him is where she always returns to when she's having a, a big moment in a match and she needs to like ground herself. And so that was something that led us to the shape of them. So they're a little elongated because they're shadows, so that we took the pieces and, you know, we. We stretched them out and modified the shape a tiny bit, but we left like the integrity of the piece as is to the practical. And then as far as how it was filled and how it moved like a shadow and kind of this like really cool accumulation of just different visual things that we had tried. We had a lot of initial conversations with Scott Frank, the director, and you know, a lot of the early direction that actually shows through to the final shots was that the pieces feel a little bit ominous, but to Beth, they're actually quite comforting and how quick they move lends itself to how sharp Beth's mind is and the kind of feel and granularity that they have was something that definitely Scott was looking for specifically. And all that work was all done in Houdini. But aside from this very obvious and necessary use of VFX, the Queen's Gambit's VFX weren't about simulating massive explosions or creating state-of-the-art motion capture technology. They were about helping to tell a storyline instead of controlling it, helping to convey emotion rather than dominating it, and most importantly, they were about subtlety. But that doesn't mean to say that the VFX weren't extensive, quite the contrary. In the Queen's Gambit, they were everywhere. Just take, for example, the establishing shot of the Methuen Orphanage. This shot of the orphanage set in winter was actually of a mansion filmed in the summer. So to fix this, they had to remove trees, add CG snow, add a CG tower, and make digital modifications to the building. But despite the amount of CGI used in this scene, there are multiple reasons as to why a scene like this isn't just redone fully CG. Was this uh, quite a time consuming shot to edit? I imagine rotoscoping things like the gates probably it wouldn't have been fun. Uh, what was the reason for the whole thing not being full CG? Well, we try to get as much in camera as possible when we shoot. It makes a lot of sense to shoot that shot and get the exact camera movement that the cinematographer wants and that the director approves and everybody's happy, you know? We did spend, you know, a fair amount of time adding the snow and matte painting and, and all that sort of work, but it just didn't make sense to build a whole world when you already have it. Yeah, I mean, in the setting in general, I think, you know, there were a few modifications that we did to the house in other shots, but any time that you are gonna return to the same setting a number of times if you can shoot it practically that's generally everyone's preference and then you just modify it as you need to if we know we're going to return there a handful of times or whatever that we try to build them in a way where you know you can repurpose them and it makes sense overall for the show and overall for the budget now, VFX budgets are often the bane of any VFX company, especially as VFX shots can vary greatly in complexity and importance. Take, for example, the imaginary chessboard that Beth sees on the ceiling. 
This is an important and characteristic shot that is both artistic and symbolic. Therefore, in order to get the effect just right, more work is needed, meaning less budget for other VFX shots. So keeping a consistent quality of VFX throughout the series can quickly become challenging. How do you deal with managing the time spent uh, on perfecting a shot like this uh, to avoid kind of going over the budget, like leaving room for other, other VFX shots? It's always a delicate balance. Obviously, the ultimate goal is to knock it out of the park creatively. And it's something that a VFX supervisor and a VFX producer work really closely together to balance. Yeah, definitely. A lot of management all the way through. Through a lot of conversation with the bigger team and then with John and I on like our internal staffing and day to day, week to week, all of that stuff. This is another reason why, aside from helping decide what shots will need VFX and then making sure every VFX shot has been adequately set up on every set, the VFX supervisor has to also be constantly looking out for anything that could alter or affect the VFX budget. When uh, there are last minute changes on a shot or an unforeseen problem happens where you're left with a compromised chroma key, how do you go about overcoming that in post uh, in a way that doesn't affect the budget that much? Hopefully it's predictable, like from set, you know, a lot of times if in the camera they can see like, oh, oh, this key is really getting too blown out or there's like a complication, you know, like it's flagged right away and we're kind of actively thinking like, okay, well, can it be repaired or does it need to be reshot or, you know, what's going to be the most cost effective approach? Sometimes, you know, if it's not a great green screen or a blue screen or like it's not going to be good to key, it's sometimes it's much more cost effective to just go and shoot on a, shoot on a stage and do some pickups, you know, because rotoing things like like hair or people that are wildly moving if you have to roto every single frame can just really blow up any budget. <laughs> so it's a collaborative effort to kind of figure out what's going to be, you know, the best case for time and budget. Most of The Queen's Gambit was filmed in Berlin, Germany, because the interiors found there could work for the majority of the show's locations. These sets were developed to portray the 1960s era, making sure the props and furnishings depicted both the set's location and the personalities and history of its occupants. The CBFX team then had to create and or extend the exterior and establishing shots for these different locations. How much leeway were you given in terms of generating accurate period recreations and how do you go about uh, researching this kind of thing? For the most part, it was getting the right feel in terms of the story and the setting and the mood, but we did try to be extremely accurate in terms of what we created. So if you were to look up photos of Las Vegas from 1968, you would see pretty much what you see in the show to the exact signage. There were some buildings in Las Vegas that every couple of years the signage would change. And we had to do a lot of research to figure out what exactly was the signage like in 1968 in Las Vegas or whatever other places in the show. There was a lot of planning before shooting happened, what the art department would create or what set deck would handle, you know, so that there was a very delicate balance between visual effects and the production crew. Now, having wrapped shooting in December 2019, the shooting of The Queen's Gambit wasn't affected at all by the COVID-19 outbreak. However, it did have an impact on a few things in post-production. How did the COVID-19 outbreak affect your ability in post-production? Yeah, I mean, we were fortunate in the, in the sense that Chicken Bone um, is always a partially remote workforce. So our management team is always in-house. Um, we have an office in LA and an office in New York. Um, but all of our artist force already works from home. So we have years prior been building a virtual platform that all of our artists tap into and, you know, work on the same files. And, you know, it's all right there living in the cloud. Okay, cool. Uh, and finally, uh, are there any interesting stories or quirky bits or hidden little secrets within the VFX that you guys at CVFX uh, can tell us about? I'm on an Easter egg hunt at the moment. <laughs> Did we plant anything that no one's found? Uh <laughs> we have one, Rez, do you remember? So. Um, in the aerial shot of Las Vegas that we did yeah. a big VFX build for, if you look closely at the traffic, Benny's blue bug oh. is driving down the strip because Benny is in Las Vegas for the tournament as well. So we <laughs> actually added his car to that shot. So that is an Easter egg that I don't think anyone has caught just yet. That's awesome. true. Yeah, it's a good one. 
Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Drop us a like if you did. Also, let us know in the comments section if you already knew about this Easter egg or not. And as always, you'll find the links to the music used in this video in the video description.